Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter of the prison of the grave. They dressed in red, white, and blue and jumped from an ancient biplane at 3,500 feet. Twice a day, every day, and nobody worried. Until five million bucks went along just for the laughs, and death went along for the ride. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Birds on the Wing. It had been the kind of quiet, workless week that speaks well for human beings and their relations with one another, but doesn't do much for a private detective's bank balance. So when at exactly noon, a telephone call had jerked me out of Chandler's new novel, The Little Sister, and a voice edged with anxiety had dangled a hundred bucks worth of negotiable bait my way, I had snapped at it. But then, I wondered if I'd done the right thing. Because it had been my must Hattie Pembroke, guardian of the millionaire thrill-seeking screwball Paige Pembroke. And now an hour later, I left the sunlight and felt my way into the gloom of the carefully tucked away Hollywood bar where she had suggested we meet. When I could see again, I spotted her at a corner table. That the old girl would be the other side of 50 and doing a little too much to disguise it, I had expected. But that she would be drinking her whiskey neat, I hadn't. When I approached her and introduced myself, Marlo, she started to come right to the point, much... but didn't quite make it. Oh, how rude of me. I'm sorry. You're probably dying for a drink. Oh, waiter. Well, frankly, no, Miss Pembroke. I'm not exactly oh, dying. Oh, no, I... no, no. I know you men in your early afternoon appetite for a friendly drink. There's no harm in it. Matter of fact, I've already had... Well, I've had a small drink myself. No fooling. Oh, waiter. Uh, this gentleman's order, please. Oh, yes, ma'am. Oh, what'll be, sir? Scotch and soda. If the lady will join me. Oh, no, no. I couldn't. I... Really? Well, all right. <laughs> uh, scotch for me, too, waiter. Johnny Walker. Yes, ma'am. Now, Mr. Marlowe, let's get down to business. Have you ever been to Oxnard, California? Uh-huh. Good. Because that's where my nephew is. Also, it's where the Calumet Valley County Fair is being held. Really? Whatever that may be. Most important, it's where you can probably find out what kind of trouble Paige is in. You see, the poor boy is... Down just... to his last five million bucks. Now, I'm sorry, Miss Pembroke. I don't think I want the job after all. Now, one moment. Why not? Well, frankly, I hope you'll excuse the reference to actual living persons, but your polo-playing, motorboat-racing, daredevil nephew is a jerk. <laughs> I know. Paige Pembroke the third is an unmitigated ass, a virile egomaniac, an idiot who's never done an honest day's work in his life. Wait, where is that drink? Right here, ma'am. Oh, thank you. Now, Mr. Marlowe, sit down and drink your drink. When I referred to my nephew as a poor boy in trouble, I was only trying to avoid saying all this. Oh. Your health, sir? Yes. Uh, well, my health. Now, your next question. Since I obviously share your sentiments about my nephew, why all this concern over him, correct? Uh, close. Right. I want to help Paige Pembroke, Mr. Marlowe, because it's my job. My, shall I say, bread and butter? All right, say it. You see, I'm executor <laughs> of his estate, which my brother, Paige's father, left for him. Well, as such, I get $20,000 a year until Paige is 35, another six years. But if Paige should die, disappear, or be committed to any kind of a public institution... Hmm? Institution. Oh. Before then, the entire estate goes to charity, and I go find another job. And specialized jobs like handling five million dollar estates are hard to come by these days, huh? Now, Mr. Marlowe, this letter here is all you have to go on. It was postmarked last night from Oxnard. Read, read. Oh. If you want your precious nephew to keep on being healthy, you'd better come and get him at once. The three of us had a nice little act going here at the Calumet Valley County Fair before he joined us just for laughs. We intend to have a nice little act going after he's gone. And one way or another, he's going to go. A friend, huh? Yeah? What? what do you think? Oh, it's five to one. It's nothing more than a woman spurned. Very young woman, Miss Pembroke. So you might be wasting a hundred dollars sending me up there. Then you'll go. Good. Yeah, but only because of my bank account. Mr. Marlowe, there'll be another hundred dollars for you if and when you get all this straightened out. 
Now, now, call me at my home, Beverly Hills. Crestview 5412. 4124? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, uh, as soon as you find out what's wrong, and oh, uh, oh, Mr. Marley. Yes, Miss Pembroke. On your way out, signal the waiter for me, will you please? <laughs> The ride to Oxnard was a pleasant but frustrating hour and a half drive along the kind of beckoning sun scrubbed Pacific shoreline that always demands to know why you have to work for a living. The ride through Oxnard to the sprawling county fairgrounds located at a semi retired airport was a fast ten minutes. So, all in all, it was a little better than three o'clock, and there was still a measure of boyish bounce in my stride when I started past the prize cows and plain and fancy leghorns and headed for the midway looking for the act Paige Pembroke could join just for laughs. But it was four o'clock and I had checked a half a dozen death-defying numbers before I was standing in front of a banner Columbus could have used for a sale and said I was getting warm. In iridescent orange cloth on black, it read, The Plunging Comets, Taffy Star and Midge Maynard on wings of death with fearless Eddie Knapp at the controls. The greatest parachute act in the world, admission free, 5 and 9 p.m., north end of the midway. Come one, come all. <laughs> yeah, this had to be it. At the north end of the midway, just outside of a sagging, weather-peeled hangar, I found the World War I biplane that went with the plunging comets being mothered by a mechanic who didn't have grease on his face. And beyond that, on an inside wall of the hangar, were the parachutes used in the act, each on a separate hook, its owner's name carefully block-lettered on a card tacked above. Taffy, Midge, and Eddie. And then, scrawled in black crayon... The name I wanted most of all to see, Paige. Lost something, mister? The voice went with the woman and the woman with the act. At the top, there was what used to be called the boyish bob sticking out of a white aviator's helmet circa 1918. Then a bright red leather jacket opened wide at the throat, black riding breeches, black boots, the color of hair that stuck out and said this one was taffy. I asked if you lost something. Have you? Well, come to think of it, yes. Six foot two, eyes are blue, and carries a big, big checkbook. <laughs> Seen one around? Maybe. Why? Who are you? Name's Philip Marlowe, the millionaire's friend. I'm a yacht salesman. Here's my card. Never mind your I, card uh... or the very funny jokes. Now, what do you really want? Paige Pembroke, before he breaks his neck in your act, or isn't he in it yet? I don't remember. Now, your point. What is it? A letter you could have written. A letter that says Paige is in trouble. Where is he? Goodbye, Mr. Marlowe. Take it easy, Wings. Ah, uh, you wouldn't want to hold out on somebody who's only trying to help Brother Paige, would you? I mean, what reason could you possibly have? Other than five million bucks you might want for your very own. Why, you... <coughs> I said goodbye. What's the matter, Taffy? You having problems? Yeah. This Mr. Yacht Salesman is Emmett Kingston, head of the fair's Midway. And you'd be surprised how popular he is with the concessionaries. Now are you going? What else? Good day, Miss Taffy, Mr. Kingston. <laughs> You know, sometimes it works. Lead with your chin, ride with a punch, and watch for your opening. And I figured I'd try it just that way. So ten minutes later, when Emmett Kingston, who was carnival people from checkered vest past ornate, watch fob the high-button shoes, and shaped like a bowling pin, left Taffy and started trundling down the midway, I went after him. When he stopped in front of a lunch wagon, I stopped too. And when he went in, approached a man playing pinball machine who was maybe five foot four, and from where I stood conscious of it, I was still behind him. At the pinball machine, a stranger with a thin face that wore a nervous toothpick was also watching the little man's game. Oh, boy, Doc, it's preaching. So when I moved closer to the trio, my face turned away from Kingston. Nobody well, seemed to well, mind. Well, I see. Jack of many trades, I see. What? Oh, oh, oh Mr. Kingston, uh, how are you, sir? Fine, Hershey, just fine. 800 more is jackpot, Doc. Come on, come on. Uh, you wanted to speak to me, Mr. Kingston? No, Hershey, nothing important except about last night. Uh, uh, last night, sir? Yeah. Uh, you were working late for a parachute rigger, weren't you, boy? Or uh, am I wrong to consider two o'clock in the morning an odd hour for you to be folding these silks? Hey, Doc, you're going to shoot it, aren't you? Which? Of course she is. Go on, I'll shoot for the uh, gentleman. Uh, yes, sir. Hey, two thousand... Three thousand, four thousand. Hey, that's great. Now do that again with your last ball, Doctor. Uh, was there something else, Mister Kingston? Yes, yeah, she. Why were you near the shoots at that hour? And uh, don't bother denying that you were, because Eddie Knapp saw you there. Well, son. Well, I, I was there to double check the riggings, Mister Kingston. 
Hey, look, I'm sick and tired of Midge Maynard complaining about the way I pack her shoot. It's a stupid excuse just trying to cover the fact that she's losing her nerve. Uh, hey, boys, don't ignore me. There is half of the jack. Shut up, you, two. and get going. Uh, Rosie, uh, get this uh, stumble bum out of here, will you? Sure, Mr. Kingston, whatever you say. Oh, and it's social, huh? All right, all right, Doc, I'm going. Of my own free will, too. But I could stay if I wanted to. Ah, uh, I see. You were saying... Well, just this, Mr. Kingston. Uh, Mitch Maynard and Taffy Star fighting because of that Pembroke fellow, or, or because Eddie Knapp is crazy about Taffy, is one thing. But but bringing me and my work into it is different. Meaning? The parachutes Midge and Taffy use are identical. In the act, both girls jump from the plane wing at the same time. But Midge always gets scared and opens her shoe sooner than Taffy. So Taffy is on the ground long before Midge. But this has nothing to do with the way I rigged the shoes, and I think all it All right, will... all right, Hershey. Nobody's blaming you. I... Uh, say, you. Yeah? You uh, wouldn't be trying to sell another yacht in here, would you? Just waiting for the finish of an exciting pinball game? Is that all right, or is it time to call Rosie again? No, no, it's quite all right. We're leaving. Uh, you try for the jackpot. Uh, come on, Hershey. It's about time for the five o'clock show. Oh, yes, Mr. King. Hmm. Only 40,000 to go. <laughs> oh, it's the first time I ever hit the jackpot. Oh, that's pretty good, Mr. Marlowe, considering that it wasn't your nickel you won on. Oh, now that you mention it, Mr. Pembroke, it wasn't. We should take care of the introductions, huh? Yeah, eh? and that leaves very little. But something. But definitely. Marlowe, you can tell Aunt Hattie from me that at the moment I don't need a watchdog. And when and if I do, I'll go to the nearest city pound for one, not to a private detective agent. I told myself it was foolish to slam the door on my way out. So I slammed the door on my way out. I started north down the midway toward the open stands and the five o'clock sharp performance of the plunging comets. When I got there, the act was already underway with the silver biplane taking off. Eddie Knapp and White at the controls, Taffy in her red jacket and parachute crouched on one wing, Midge Maynard in blue jacket and shoot on the other. Then as they slowly gained altitude, High Button Shoes himself took over the PA. They did it up well, and by the time the plane was at about 3,000 feet, every pair of eyes was riveted skyward, and an expectant hush thicker than winter fog had settled everywhere. At 3,500 feet, the plunging comet, Taffy Star and Mitch Maynard, with Pierce and Eddie Knapp and the control. They will not open their parachutes until they are within 500 feet of the ground. Now watch. They should be ready. Knees drawn up tight, arms close into their sides, they jumped. Specks in the sky growing bigger as they fell. 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 feet, and then, from taffy shoot cloth, long and colored, a huge flag rippling in the wind from the end of a long rope. The flag seemed to rise above her as she fell, until the slack was gone, and then suddenly a chute opened, billowing. And then Midge, another flag rippling from the end of a long rope, and then, then the flag drifting free. Midge's chute not open, Midge plummeting down, down to the hard ground. Thud slammed home all the way around, kicking hard at every stomach. A minute ago, a girl, very much alive. Our smashed still body. Someplace near me, a woman cried. There was a bitter, sick, sweet taste in my mouth as I headed for the hangar where I'd first met Taffy. At the moment, I figured the guy who packed the parachutes was a good man to see. But when I got there, the only one present was Emmett Kingston. Stop right there, boy, and tell me straight and fast just who you are. Philip Marlowe, Los Angeles private detective, Mr. Kingston. You can prove that? Sure. Here. Here's my business card, state license, county permit. Yeah. I'm working for Paige Pembroke's aunt. She wants his nibs kept out of trouble. Which has what to do with your being here now, Marlowe? Here at this hangar, I mean. Close to where the parachutes are kept. I'm not sure, Kingston. I've only got a hunch. A hunch that Midge Maynard's death was no accident. Yeah, I got more than that already, Mr. Detective. I've got proof. Oh? You see this flag? It's uh -huh. the one that came off Midge's chute. There's a long rope attached to it. Yeah, I know. I saw the act. Pulls the chute open after the flag's flown a while, right? Sometimes, but not tonight, Mr. Marlowe. Tonight it couldn't. Why not? Wasn't it attached to the chute? It was. One end to the chute release cord, the other to the base of the flag. What went wrong? Nothing. 
Nothing, Mr. Marlowe, except that the long rope on Midge's chute was cut in two by a very sharp knife. In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, Sunday nights on CBS. The biggest bargain in show business today. Skelton, Bergen, and Benny without spending a penny. Amos and Andy, Eve Arden, Corliss Archer. Four A's, four-star entertainment. The Family Hour with its Hollywood stars and stirring dramas. The Contented Hour with its musical stars and brilliant form. Horace Height with his rising stars. Eight great shows heard on most of these same CBS stations every Sunday night, with the ninth, Jack Benny, being heard on them all. Hear them all this Sunday night. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Birds on the Wing. Midge Maynard's grim accident turned out to be grim a murder. I left Kingston and headed for a phone to call my client. Everywhere the chill of the viciously spectacular death lay like a soggy blanket. At the exposition office, I found a phone and finally got through to Hattie Pembroke. She listened up to the word murder and then, between gasps, insisted on coming out to help me. When I hung up, I turned to see that the pilot, Eddie Knapp, had been standing in the door listening. He looked sick. What's it to you, mister? What's what to me? Midge. The long drop she took out there. And Pembroke. I heard you say Pembroke. What do you got to do with him? Just a minute, fella. I'm not sure it's any of your business. It's my business, all right. That kid gave me a big grin up there just before she jumped. And I watched her fall every inch of the way. So did everybody else. Look, I know how you feel, You don't have any idea how I feel. Don't try to kid me. That mob out there loved it. That's the only reason they come to watch, the hypocritical buzzards. You got a finger in this pie, and angle all your own. I'm going to find out what it is. Take it easy, Nap. You're talking yourself into something real silly. Yeah? Listen, ever since that louse Pembroke showed up here, there's been trouble brewing. Now Midge is dead. She was a friend of mine. Best friend I had. Aren't you pulling a switch, Buster? What happened to your red-hot passion for Taffy Star? Oh, you nosy... Come here, you jerk. Look out for my arm. Yeah, bus boy, and unless you want to take off with a busted <laughs> wing, stand still. Now get this, Eddie. I've got no beef with you yet. In fact, we might even be on the same team because I want Pembroke out of here just as much as you do. So cool off. Who are you? Private detective named Marlowe. And I got news for you. Midge fell because her shoot was fixed. She was murdered. Mur- you heard me. Where? Where's Hershey? He packed the shoots. Have you talked to him? No, I can't find him. You mean he's run away? With that filthy half pint psycho? Listen, for your own sake, Eddie, leave Hershey to me and the police. You know where he's staying? No, no, I don't. In town someplace. But didn't he ever tell you where? Come on, think, Eddie. Well, yeah, he told me he had a buddy in town. Some guy who runs a pool hall. I didn't pay much attention. That's enough for a starter. I'll find him. And keep a lid on your temper, Eddie. I'll see you. As I crossed the grounds to my car, I looked back once at Eddie Knapp standing in the office door, rubbing the shoulder I twisted for him. I hoped he'd stay out of circulation until I got back because the barnstorming flyer was charged up like a high-tension wire. The way he felt there'd be sparks no matter who he touched. Taffy, Pembroke, or Lyle Hershey. But my immediate worry was the location of the lambing parachute packer, so I drove into Oxnard, found a phone booth, and went through the book calling pool parlors. I finally hit pay dirt at a joint called Pindy's. It's 212B Street, upstairs in the back. 212B Street was an apartment, second floor rear over a boarded-up fish market. I went up the stairs to the half-open door with my hand around my 38. But the shooting part was all over. Because Lyle Hershey was crumpled in the bedroom door with the slovenly abandon that violent death always has. The look of the puddle of blood under him had been that way over an hour. I started backing out. Just as someone else started up the stairs. So I flattened myself against the wall beside the kitchen door and waited. Lyle. Lyle, it's Taffy. Come on in. Take a good look, Taffy. What are you doing in here? Where's Lyle? It's a great act, baby. Holds water like a duck's back. What do you mean? That wherever there's murder, there's also motive, and you've got it, Taffy. Lots of it. Me? What are you talking about? Maybe he's dead, and maybe you killed him. Keep him quiet, because maybe he fouled up Midge Maynard's parachute on your orders. Consequently, he had you over a barrel. On my orders? You're out of your mind. And maybe you had to get Midge out of the way because you objected to Paige Pembroke and his idle millions honing into the act. 
Objected so strenuously that she was doing something about it, such as sending threats to his Aunt Hattie. Let's face it, baby, it fits. But not tight enough, Marlowe. Oh, Paige, darling. Taffy, I got worried when you didn't come back to the car, so I hey, decided... Don't move, Marlowe, or I'll shoot. Pembroke, if you got any sense in that gold-plated skull I'll of yours... I'll show it, Marlowe. I stood outside and listened to enough of your crackpot theories to know you're nuts. I don't need any advice from you at this point, so keep your long nose out of my business. Now listen, you hair brain oh, dope. just stand there like a good little boy. Taffy and I are leaving, and don't try to follow too fast. Go on, Taffy, outside. I'll follow you. So long, detective. <laughs> I let him go. I spent 20 useless minutes searching the almost bare apartment for any kind of an answer, but came up with nothing. Hershey's buddy at my feet convinced me there was nothing in Oxnard for Marlow. And the sooner I dumped the whole mess into the laps of local law and order, the better. So I kicked out the 10 cent lock on the flimsy door and went down the stairs. I cut through an alley to the street and started across to where my car was parked, when I was bracketed by a pair of headlights on a sleek Nash convertible. Hey there! Marlowe! Marlowe! What you doing here, boy? Nothing. Even that's an exaggeration, Kingston. What about you? I thought you had a show tonight. I certainly do, but the police don't give a hoot about that, boy. No. They insisted that I bring the rest of Midge Maynard's parachute harness in for investigation. Mm-hmm. Uh, get in and come along, will you, son? Maybe you can help me out. Okay. I want to see the police myself. Oh, is this Midge's stuff in? That's it. Don't mind holding it, do you? No. You know, this is a waste of time, boy. All they have to do is pick up Lyle Hershey and they'll get all the answers. They'll have to pick him up, all right, but he'll give him problems, not answers, Mr. Kingston. Lyle Hershey's dead. He was murdered. Uh, you see, Lyle... Yeah, yeah, I just came from his place. Somebody shot him. Great suffering sardines. Well, uh, that means there's another killer. And uh, still on the loose. Uh, I knew I shouldn't let him do it. But who do what? Why, Taffy's going to give an air performance tonight. They pulled me into the grounds just as I was leaving and told me that uh, Pembroke fella's going up to Midge's place. You mean those two showed up out yeah. there? It doesn't make sense. Well, Pembroke's got plenty of nerve in his own shoot, so I guess... Shoot? He's a... Yeah, he's... A... Wait a minute, wait a minute, Kingston. Stop under that streetlight, will you? Why, uh-huh. What is it, Marlo? What are you looking at? Sure, sure. Red smudges on the inside of these straps. There's something wrong here, Kingston, but I can't quite peg it. Say, Kingston, what time is that performance going to start? Wait, well, nine o'clock. Five minutes and five miles to go. Come on, boy, turn the heap around and rump on it. We got a killer to catch. Swing out in front of the hangar, Kingston. Hurry. It's empty. They're already out on the runway. Yeah, there's one parachute still on the rack. Why, that's Eddie Knapp's chute, and he never goes up without it. So who's at the controls of that plane out there? I don't even have to guess. It's Eddie Knapp, all right, but he figures a suicide doesn't need a shoot. But... Pile out, Kingston. It's as far as you go. I'm taking over from right. here. What are you talking about? Come on, about? move. Get out. They're turning around now. Yeah, he's going to make us run back this way. So long, Kingston. Here he comes. Well, what are you doing? Come back. I waited until there was no possible chance for a miss. Then I headed the car straight into the path of the plane, pulled the hand throttle out as far as it would go, and jumped. <laughs> was easy. The plane sort of stumbled over the car, rolled up on its nose and stayed there. Quick work by the volunteer crash crew took care of that. A box of bandages took care of the collection of minor cuts and bruises all around and the Oxnard police took care of Eddie Knapp. Everything had come out more or less even, except my client, Hattie Pembroke. She showed up at the finish line slightly on the bias, which no doubt was her normal late evening state. Also, she was as full of questions as an insurance adjuster. Now, young man, I paid you a substantial sum of money for this day's work, and therefore, as your employer, I'm certainly entitled to a comprehensive report of the entire business. And I insist... All right, all right, Hattie, Hattie, whoa. (laughs) I'll run through it once more, and that's all. Now, look, first, the threatening letter you got was written by Midge Maynard because she was afraid Paige was going to break up the act, you get it? But the real screwball was Eddie Knapp. He was crazy about Taffy's tar and insanely jealous when your nephew and his money showed up. Knapp decided if he couldn't have Taffy, nobody else would, because he'd kill her. And yet Midge Maynard was the one who got killed. You catch on quick. Knapp killed Hershey because he was afraid Hershey had seen him tampering with the shoots. You get that? No. No. On second thought, Milo, maybe you better submit a written report tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, with adding machine and clothes. Now, look, Hattie, it's not that... Hey, Milo. Milo, Paige and I want to apologize. We treated you pretty badly tonight, and, well, you did save our lives. Business is business. Yeah, that's right. He was hired to do a job, dear, and he did it. I'm only interested in one thing, Marlowe. How'd you know it was Eddie Knapp? 
Well, nobody had a really good motive for killing both Midge and Hershey, so when I realized the shoots had been switched, I knew Midge's murder was a mistake. From there, it was easy. How'd you find that out, Marlowe? From red smudges on the inside of the harness shoulder straps. Red that had to come from your leather jacket there, Taffy. The one Midge always wore was blue. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. Well, Hattie, write the detective a check so he can go. That's the best idea you've had to date, Pembroke. And include on it the price of a repair job on Kingston's car, a new tweed suit to replace this one that lost knees and elbow on the runway when I jumped. And also, don't forget the bonus you promised for keeping your job alive, Hattie. Oh, just a minute, Marlowe. As for you, Pembroke, the only reason I'm not filing an assault and battery charge against you is that you've got great grounds for a countersuit. What do you mean? This! <clears throat> Bless you, my boy. Mail me the check. Good night. Well, a few informal cups of coffee at the Oxnard Police Headquarters cut through most of the paperwork. But at that, it was after two when I finally picked up my car and drove the inland highway for home, past dark, quiet farms, where down-to-earth people made down-to-earth livings and slept at night. Yeah, the countryside was full of them. So it was with a real sigh of relief that I finally opened the door to my apartment. And look forward to some peace and quiet. Hello, Mr. Marlowe. Uh, aren't you Gracie Allen? Yes. Well, how'd you get into my apartment? Well, you see this key? Yeah. Well, it didn't fit, so I opened the door and walked in. Yeah, well, that figures. Uh, what can I do for you? Uh, Mr. Marlowe, you're a famous detective, and I think you're just the man to handle a very important case for me. Oh, really? Well, I'd be very happy to, Gracie. What's your problem? Well, you see, Mr. Marlowe, our sponsor won't let my husband, Sugar Throat Burns, sing on our program. Mm -hmm. And I want you to investigate the possibilities of another radio program George can sing on. Mm -hmm. And then our sponsor will realize he's wonderful and let him sing on our show. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, Gracie, and the next time you pass my house, I'll be very grateful. Oh, thank you, and I'll be looking for you, too. Goodbye. Goodbye. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Lois Corbett, Rita Lynn, Don Randolph, Junius Matthews, Jack Moyles, and Jimmy Eagles. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Arant. <laughs> Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... It started with a kid hawking papers on Hollywood Boulevard and moved from there to a house full of hate on a quiet street, a blonde liar on ice skates and a corpse in a burned-out shack, and it all wound up right where it began, in the heart of the kid on the corner. Two music programs that make your Sunday afternoon listening a delight and a pleasure are the Symphonette and the Coraliers. The Coraliers sing popular and semi-classical songs in stirring style. The Symphonette brings you excerpts of great orchestral works. Hear the Symphonette and the Coraliers tomorrow and every Sunday, as well as Sammy Kay's Sunday Serenade, now heard exclusively on CBS. All of these outstanding music programs are heard on most of these same CBS stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Stay tuned now for Gangbusters, which follows immediately on most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.